good news as public schools in Colorado take a bold stand against state-mandated comprehensive sex ed. Nice to know that the haze of marijuana smoke has not impaired everyone's judgment in the Rocky Mountain State. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Welcome back to Monday. We actually have some good educational news for a Monday. I hope you had a productive weekend. Today, we're going to be looking at the failure of the fad known as Social Emotional Learning, SEL. Plus, a new bill in Wisconsin would require cursive writing, hallelujah, to be taught in elementary schools, but some say third graders should be coding instead of learning how to write. But we start in Colorado, where another school says it will not, N-O-T, follow a new state law requiring radical sex education to be taught in the classroom. And that is exactly right. Liberty Common School, which is actually a charter school but supported with public dollars, won't teach sex ed according to the new bill. And this is really a, a big development, Katie. I mean, again, it's a charter school, but we also have a district in Colorado who also refuses to teach. Yeah, just about, it was at the end of August, District 38 and Monument announced they were not going to follow that new law, and they claim it's a state requirement. It's taking away that authority from the local school districts. Huh, to think that the local school districts should be deciding what to actually teach the children who are in the local school districts. Well, the funny thing is, is that most states that took the garbage, that the garbage rot that is Common Core, and let us remind you again, Common Core is not just a set of curriculum or standards. Common Core is a feeder for all of these disgusting sexuality programs we currently have. School districts can be doing this all across the board. The reason we got stuck with Common Core is because state educators took it and then all the districts run by superintendents fell into line. No one was really given much of a chance. And yet, the argument that can be made is, is that in most states, local school districts have the authority to reject it. The fact that you've got a district, monument district in Colorado, and you've got a charter school who are now telling the state, no way, maybe, maybe, maybe this can begin, be the beginning of something nationwide where all the local, and school, local school control can now push back, uh, now that they've seen for seven or eight years. Not only how ineffective the standards are, how poor the curriculum is, and now they're seeing the, the, the secondary stuff, the bad history teaching, the sexuality, all the things that we've been warning about, now they're seeing it. Maybe they'll begin to push back more earnestly. Now, uh, I'd like all of you to note that Dr. Duke just had a bit of optimism. Mark it down on your calendar. This doesn't happen much, so this is, this is great news for all of us here. And I like how it's Liberty Common School, of all places. Great name for them. Uh, you said they were a charter school. They're in Fort Collins, and so they applied for a waiver to get waived then, obviously, from the state. And uh, the Colorado and local um, media reported that the school's headmaster has been very outspoken about the law and that he says that premarital abstinence is consistent with the school's virtues. The new law requires schools to teach a more comprehensive version of sex ed. We've talked about all of this before. Um, and that had included a lot of information and a lot of other things about contraception. And this headmaster says, no, that's not what our kids are, who yeah, they are it's, here. It's even a little bit worse than that. If you remember the show we covered on, on these, this proposed Colorado law, it would make discussing abstinence in the classroom illegal. A Theoretically, under the, Calif the Colorado bill, a teacher who talks about or promotes abstinence in the classroom could theoretically be guilty of an actual crime. And so when this Liberty Common, uh, Common director of the school comes out and says, look, abstinence is perfectly in line with our values, right? That we will teach kids the truth, that the only surefire way to avoid pregnancy and or sexually transmitted diseases is the practice of abstinence. That's, it seems to me that that's a the basest of baselines, places to draw a line, but no one else in the, st in the, in the country seems to be drawing it. So congratulations to, Colo con congratulations to Colorado for doing it, both in the charter segment and in at least one public school district. And I want parents to take note of this. It's the parent-led board of directors mm -hmm. who really pushed this. And, and so we have this happening at, you know, where can we uh, take back control? What can we do? It, I've said it many a time, it's at the local mm -hmm district you have to go to the board meetings where there is no one there but me the local reporter who's who's sent there to report on what happening what's happening but that's where you can make a change and the people who are on your school board hopefully have the best interests of those who are the students in the seats so 
if you can get to them, talk to them, reason with them, that's how you can make change at the local level. Yeah, and let me temper the optimism. It is a Monday <laughs> after. Let me temper the optimism Fine. a little bit. The other thing we got to find out, they've applied for a waiver to the state. Guess who's paying for that charter school through taxes? The state of Colorado. What makes you think the state of Colorado, who passed this radical sex bill to begin with, is going to say, oh, you don't want to join us. Well, we're going to let you skip out, and we're going to keep giving you your public funding. We shall see how this plays out. Now, remember when I said to write down, mark down that optimism he had? I guess you can just wipe it away. It lasted it was less than five minutes. It was there. But it was I would there. be remiss, R-E-miss, if I didn't point out what we've been saying many times. All forms of public education are corrupted. The moms and dads who are on the school, this board, at this Liberty Common Charter School, they have the best of intentions. I have no doubt they teach primarily an outstanding curriculum, probably very classical. But you're getting paid by state taxpayer-funded money, which means they can tell you to go pound salt. Well, let's uh, bring it home because we actually have some good news coming out of Wisconsin where a new bill that's circulating in the Capitol right now would require our, our elementary students to be taught <gasps> cursive writing. Uh, the bill is actually sponsored by the chairs of both chambers of the education committees. So that's that's something important to note. It's, I want to give a shout out to Representative Jeremy Thiesfeld, who is my representative, and Senator Luther Olson, as well as Democratic Senator Latanya Johnson. And this is still in the very early stages, and it would require the Department of Public Instruction to incorporate cursive writing back into the curriculum in the language arts model. Back in the day, we actually used to learn it, but now they don't. And it would require public, private, and charter schools to have the students be legibly able to write in cursive by the end of fifth grade. Yeah, first of all, I don't like the fact, I gotta say pessimistically, as much as I wanna see <laughs> cursive writing oh, back in the curriculum, what gives the state of Wisconsin the right to tell private schools what they will and won't do? Having said that, we know for a fact that all the evidence is in. Uh, cursive writing is good for kids. It triggers parts of their brain that printing and typing doesn't. It, it has all sorts of uh, uh, salubrious effects on memory, of, on cognition. Mm -hmm. it, it's a good thing to do. We should never have gotten rid of it. Uh, the fact is that, that there is some serious opposition to this in Wisconsin tells you how far the edu rats are going to try to destroy traditional education. Sure, and Thiesfeld actually was a teacher in an elementary classroom and then uh, uh, at the high school level for tw mm -hmm. over 20 years before this. So he actually has some experience of being in a Wisconsin classroom and teaching the kids. And he <laughs> says that cursive is a basic skill that schools have always taught, and I see it still as being important. It's been, I think, an unfortunate thing that schools have turned away from it. And he says, I think that our students should be able to read their original manuscripts of the Declaration of Independence or the United States Constitution or a myriad of other old documents. I yeah, agree with that. I remember seven years ago when we had our Common Core okay. hearings, six years ago when we had our Common Core hearings in the state, that's what I said. He was on that panel, Mr. Thiesfeld, as it were a number of Democrats. I suppose you could say that this is also progress in the sense that it's bipartisan. This bill sure. seems to have bipartisan support. Uh, let's get into the schools. But the, the one of the most alarming things is some of the opposition, the pushback against this. Kids at this age shouldn't be worried about obsolete techniques like cursive writing. They should be coding. We should you have. Give it away. Let me give the direct quote. Go give the direct quote. Direct quote, and we have to give it credit where credit is due to Dan Rossmiller, the governmental relations director. He said the Wisconsin Association of School Boards will likely oppose. While we were saying school boards mm. are the ones who can do good things in Colorado, in Wisconsin, apparently they're going to do and bad things. And that's why I told you it's hard to work the school board uh, angle. Can, okay. But anyway. At the smaller, I'm from the smaller districts. <laughs> I Okay. Anyway, they're going to likely oppose this bill when it is formally introduced. And Ross Miller actually questioned the relevance of the proposal and what schools would be giving up. And this is what he says. There are a number of school districts and school boards uh, who have decided that they don't think cursive writing is something they ought to be spending time on. I'm inclined to think that we should be teaching students how to code mm. instead of teaching them cursive. Yeah, because they don't get enough screen time as it is in public schools. Didn't journal, wasn't there that big outrage about like yeah. hashtag learn to code or learn right. how to code and then everyone blew up like, how dare you say that? Yeah. Where are the journalists come now and defend this cursive well, writing? The other thing that's really bothersome about this, this clown show, Dan Ross Miller, with the Constant Association of School Boards, that tells you something. These school boards, even when you put parents on them, there's a yeah. broader association. Of course there kind is. of like the Chamber of Commerce for public schools who are making some of these decisions and bringing a lot of money and a lot of pressure to bear to keep what they want in and what they don't want out. But the, the problem with this, and it's a big problem it seems to me, is this idea idea that um, traditional forms of learning, that, that comment he made, 
look, we're really concerned about if we teach these kids cursive, what will we have to take out to do it? Mm. And yet, with all this sexuality garbage yep. coming in, that doesn't bother them. Nope. No, we hear nope. nothing from the Ross Millers of the world about forcing all of this garbage left-wing social justice activism into the classroom. We're not worried if our kids can't read, write, or do math. But when it comes to something as basic and simple and traditional as cursive writing, we better be concerned about what? Maybe if we teach kids how to write cursively, they won't be able to learn about anal sex in third oh. grade. Uh, just so everyone's aware, there are about 15 states right now that do require cursive writing. And I remember, we, we I was even taught cursive writing growing up. I had to stay in one time in recess in second grade because I, my R's, I struggled writing the R with mm. my left hand, so I, I missed a recess. Never missed one again. I made them perfect after that day. I had a similar issue with with small B's and small D's. I flipped them in my... Oh, I, you did? Yes, I... What do you call that? Dyslexified them. Yeah, you, yeah, switched you them around. Them. All right, yeah. well, so 15 states do require it. So Wisconsin would become the 16th. Check with your local state, obviously, to see if you guys require it. You probably don't. But uh, you talked about all these other things that they are spending their time doing in the classroom. Well, one of those other things is focus on, focusing on the social emotional learning of our students. So social emotional learning, SEL, you may have heard about it. We claim it's a fad. And what do you know? It's not delivering on the results. So just so everyone's, if you haven't heard of it, it's basically described as a way of understanding and managing student emotions through intense data gathering. Data gathering. So basically what happens is your teachers, instead of focusing on the curriculum and teaching their students, they're analyzing their students, make sure, you know, how are they mm -hmm. feeling today? Has, has there been a pattern of, of little Johnny looking sad in the mornings, but by the afternoon he's okay? That's what they're doing. Social emotional learning is one of those Trojan horse concepts like comprehensive sex ed that comes along with garbage like Common Core. And what it is is you compel teachers to spend as much or more time in the classroom psychologically and socio sociologically evaluating kids through these programs, these online programs like PBIS mm -hmm. is one of them, where you spend all this time documenting how they react, what their emotional responses are. In other words, a complete and total distraction away from the business of classroom learning in favor of monitoring and data gathering. And, and by the way, our high school, elementary, and middle school public schools teachers, according to all the tests, are struggling, struggling, struggling to simply teach your kids how to read, write, and do math. They're not doing a very good job. Do you really think they're qualified to sociologically and psychologically understand your kids, to diagnose what's going on with these kids? The answer is no. No, they are not. They can't. Math teachers can't teach math. You're telling me that a math teacher is now going to socially and emotionally learning-wise Assess your child's behavior. Well, a pediatrician who actually has a degree, mm. who's a doctor, Karen Ephraim, she's the president of Education Liberty Watch. She says that public schools continuously want to expand SEL. Mm. I wonder why. Uh, even though national spending in public K-12 schools is already exceeding $30 billion every year. I'm going to say it again. $30 billion every year for just all this, this spending that we put into our K-12 schools, and they, again, they can't read, they can't write, they can't do math, but this SEL and the PBIS, it's the what, beh positive behavioral mm -hmm. interventions, or whatever, they're putting it at K-12 system. So mm -hmm. what happens in our local schools, and we talked about this in our education class, is of how to reward our students mm -hmm. when they are being positive in their behavior. And they give them little, some school districts call it different things. They call it scratch tickets or bucks. So you can trade it in to get prizes. And okay, if you're a first grader, that's incentive. If you're a junior in high school, you should not be given pieces of paper to turn in to get this little is, prizes. This is treating our children like Pavlovian dogs, right? It, so ding, it doesn't matter that the curriculum ding. sucks. It doesn't matter that the teaching instruction sucks. It doesn't matter that the actual amount of time spent on serious study in classes sucks. It doesn't matter. If you conform, mm. if when you're getting sex in third grade and fourth grade, radical forms, of you nod and smile and seem interested, that's, you, you get the little, yep. the little pellet, right? Yep. You, you pre like the rat in the, in the maze. You press the little button, you get the little pellet. What they're doing is giving your kids an, an education that is not intellectually based. It's based on politics, it's based on progressivism, it's based on squishy, soft, social, emotional learning things. And when they conform without complaint, they're good little kids. The problem is when they don't. 
When your kids don't conform and smile and play along, when your kid who's gifted at your third grader, who's gifted in math, he can do 10th grade math, is not allowed to do 10th grade math, he's anchored to the failed third grade math curriculum you're teaching him, and that kid acts out a little bit, he's educationally disabled. He's developmentally disabled now. And that's why we see that there are states, New York City especially, uh, in terms of the largest school district in the whole nation, trying to get rid of gifted and talented because we can't have anyone right. outside of that getting away from Don't our common Don't you see that factors, allowing bringing talented in. kids mm -hmm. to study in advance is not emotionally well it's for not. those kids who can't do it. So we've got to eliminate that. So in other words, you're creating psychological problems in an attempt to manage them. And all of this has about nothing to do with education. And the main thing here is that Dr. Ephraim, again, a doctor, says the expansion of SEL would really erode the fundamental right of parents to control the education and upbringing of their children because of this unjustified expansion of the schools, which we have seen uh, over and over again. And she says there's little to no proof that SEL propels students to any sort of greater academic achieve it, achievement and personal fulfillment. Her quote is, unfortunately, big corporate America and education technology companies really want to push this stuff. Gee. Wow, I wonder why. Uh, the corporations want workers who are programmed to act a certain way, and the education technology companies just want to make yeah. money. Which, Beat them yeah. down. Fit the square pegs into the round holes, right? And so th these are good little conformists who won't ask for raises and that kind of stuff when you hire them, if you eventually hire them. What this is, this is a replacement of actual learning, study, academic mastery with pseudoscience, junk, pharmacology, some of the drugs, and then sociology. This has nothing at all to do with educating your child. It is about turning your child into a cardboard cutout, a one-size-fits-all cardboard cutout who could fit in the grocery store bagging line at your local supermarket one day without complaint. That's the end of this. Well, it was a sort of happy Monday, some sort of positive in there. Uh, but we're going to wrap it up for today for this episode of The Dr. Duke Show. As always, please share the episode and subscribe to the free audio podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and everywhere else. Just visit drdukeshow.com and click on any of the platforms on the top of the screen to subscribe for free. And that does it for us today. Look, I, I promise you I'll come up with more positivity for tomorrow. In fact, I'll be positive that we're going to have some really stupid school stories to report to you. We'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Time for Freedom Project. I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And stay educated, my friends.